So today we are uh, touching on something that I believe is very important. Uh, I, I'm starting a brand new series uh, two Sundays from now. So not next Sunday, but the next. And, and I, I'm really excited. It's, it's just going gonna, gonna to be called something along the lines of uh, the Fellowship's Got Talent or something like that. So uh, we haven't landed on it yet, but uh, it's going to be exciting. But in the meantime, I felt a very... A strong directing of the Holy Spirit to spend the next two Sundays talking about something that is going to change your life if you will put it into operation. Do you remember uh, watching a movie? It could be a cowboy movie, uh, a sci-fi movie with aliens, uh, a cop show, uh, ca cowboys and, uh, and villains or whatever it is that you're watching. Every one of those movies has one thing in common. At some point in the movie or the TV show, you're going to see the good guys get pinned down by enemy fire. The enemy is firing at them, and they're realizing that they cannot win the firefight from the position they're in. So one of them will turn and look at the other one, and what do they scream before they take off running out into open space? Cover me! That's what they're screaming every time. They're going to say, cover me. And what this means is I'm pinned down. I need to get away to safety or I need to get to another leverage point where I can get a better shot at taking out the enemy that's trying to take us out. But I can't get there without your help. I need you to cover me. I need you to lay down some fire at the enemy to give me a chance to run to this next vantage point so that I can help us get to a place of victory. So today I want to talk to you from this subject, Cover Me. In 1984, the boss himself, Bruce Springsteen, recorded a song. And the lyrics go like this. The times are tough now, just getting tougher. This old world is rough. It's just getting rougher. Cover me. Come on, baby, cover me. Outside's the rain, the driving snow. I can hear the wild wind blowing. Turn out the light, bolt the door. I ain't going out there no more. This whole world is out there just trying to score. I've seen enough. I don't want to see any more. Cover me. Come on and cover me. Now, I, I, when I heard these lyrics and I, I saw a YouTube video of, of Bruce singing this song, I thought, man, whoever wrote these lyrics was like closing up shop. They were done with the world. They were latching the door and saying, I just ain't going out there anymore. Sounded to me like they were giving up on life because they perceived that the world had so much trouble going on in it. I've heard parents say, I don't want to bring a kid into this world. You know what? This is a sad state of affairs to me. Because if you really believe in your God, number one, and you really believe in your power and influence because of God in you, number two, then you need to bring more kids into the world so that they can increase your team that's out there making a difference in this dark world. We have to stop seeing ourselves as victims and start seeing ourselves as victors. God did not call us as a church to be a hunk down church. He called us to be a dangerous church. He called us to be a church that impacts the world, that is salt and light in our world, both of which are invasive agents of change. This is who Jesus called his church to be. I don't know what church you're a part of, but I want to be a part of the Jesus church. And the Jesus church doesn't hunker down. The Jesus church moves forward to take new territory. It doesn't matter what season that we are in. As a pastor, my spiritual job is to cover those that God brings into this church. To cover this church with prayer, with spiritual leadership, with guidance, with counsel. We have ministers in the house that have started their own nonprofit organizations and they're doing amazing things in our community and in our world. But they all know 
that if they don't have a spiritual family, a, a church family that's covering them in prayer, and a pastor that's covering them with spiritual authority, that they will get destroyed out there by the power of the enemy as they are trying to do this work for God. We have business people that are movers and shakers in our church congregation, politicians, people that are holding public office, that are out there doing great work in the community, but they know that they need covering, and they will come to me often. A business person will come to me and say, hey, pastor, I'm not going to be here next Sunday. I'll be in such and such state. I'm making a business deal, and it's going to bless me, and, and if it blesses me, it's going to bless the church, so I need you to cover me. Cover me, pastor. Pray for me. This is vitally important. Important. We need covering. I cover my wife and my children as a spiritual leader of my home. And if the enemy comes against our house with an assignment, my wife and I are standing at the front door saying, Not today, Satan, not on our watch. We are covering our family with spiritual authority. Spiritual authority is important. I am a 54-year-old senior pastor, and I am covering a lot of people. But I am thankful that I still have my father, 80 years old, the founder of this church, sitting on the front row of this house, and he's still covering me. And I'm so thankful for that. I got a group of elders, senior pastors from other churches around the country to whom I make myself accountable. And these guys are covering me so that if I ever start to take a wrong turn because I get discouraged or I get sidetracked spiritually or mentally, that they're, got, they're there to say, hey, Kev, you need to come back over here, bro. You're too close to danger over there. That spiritual covering is vitally important to me. Having a spiritual covering is essential to our spiritual success. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden. Because if it's a burden to them, then it's not going to be a benefit to you. So he says, let's do the thing right. So there's spiritual covering that's important. But in addition to spiritual covering, there's something else that we call prayer cover that is vitally important. There are people in this church that cover Pastor Melissa and me. And they pray for us on a regular basis, sometimes more than others, when God will put our faces in their minds and their hearts and they will just begin to pray for us and, and to intercede for us. And I'm going to tell you right now, I know, I know in my heart that I would not be here today if it wasn't for these precious people that pray for me on a regular basis. It's so important. And so... We are entering a 15-day season of prayer that I believe is going to make a huge difference for our church, for our nation, but certainly for you who are in this service today who are going to participate with us. This is election week, as Aaron mentioned, Oren mentioned and we need God's sovereign hand to guide this country in the way that he wants to go. We must be praying. And this prayer that Jesus challenged us to pray, both this week leading up to the election and next week post-election as the votes are being counted and the announcements are being made, Jesus told us to pray. We have to be praying this week, next week. We should be praying all the time, but especially during these next two week, weeks. So I am asking you to join our pastoral team and me to commit to what we're calling 15 for 15. The 15 for 15 campaign. That means that over the next 15 days, you will commit to taking 15 minutes a day and dedicate it aside for God. If it means you have to wake up 15 minutes earlier and get in your living room in the quiet, whatever. If you have to stay up 15 minutes later at your house, 
if you have to take a 15-minute section out of your lunch hour and find a broom closet somewhere on your job. Find 15 minutes to set aside. Now, if you already pray more than 15 minutes a day, don't decrease to 15 minutes. Keep doing what you're doing. But if you only pray five minutes a day, then jump up to 15. If you don't pray any a day, then I challenge you to stretch yourself and to carve out a 15-minute dedicated space of time to pray and to really talk to God. You may say, well, I don't really know what to pray. I'm going to help you with that. On the Fellowship Texas City app, you're going to be able to go there and just tap on the 15 for 15, and it's going to lead you to all the prayers that are available for you to pray. There's the Lord's Prayer, there's Paul's Prayers, there's all kinds. Of, there's just no more excuses to not pray. We've set you up. A man was telling me the other day, I really don't know how to pray. And I said, well, go to the, I said, download the app. He downloaded the app. I said, punch this. He punched it, punched that, punched it. I said, check that out. And he went, well, there goes all my excuses. And I just laughed. Because there are no more excuses. Our amazing team has made this happen for you so that you have all the help you need to pray. And the Holy Spirit is with you to pray. So I'm asking you to commit. If you will, then God is going to help us to grow together. You're going to grow with us. Philippians 4 and 6, Paul said, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. The Apostle James told us to confess our sins to one another, pray for each other so that we may be healed. And then watch this. He said, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. You need a change in your life? Start praying because Jesus is going to hear what you say and he is going to make a change for your life. Throughout the Bible, God invites us to pray. He urges us to pray, and he even commands us to pray. You may say, why should I pray? What, what is it really going to do? Does it really make a difference? The devil's going to come to your ear, and he's going to say that the audacity, you're, you're just so, you're so arrogant to think that your little prayer is, can make a dent in everything that I'm doing in the world. And he tries to intimidate you into not praying. But God has specifically said that if just one person will begin to pray, it gives God the power to move in the earth. It gives him an open channel through which to flow his power. You say, does God really need that open channel? Yes, he does, because it's how he set it up. He wants partners in the earth. That's why Jesus told us uh, to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why did he tell us to pray that way? Because he set it up that he will not do anything in the earth unless we give him the permission to do it. Because he gave command of the earth to mankind. It's God's gift to mankind. And now it's up to us to make sure we invite him to be who he is in heaven, but in the earth. Just going to let that sink in for a second. I need you to understand the authority that God has given you as a human being. You have the power to invite God to be everything that he already is in heaven. In your sphere of influence. If you don't like how things are going in your home. If you don't like how things are going on in your neighborhood or on your job or at your school. I have a question for you. Have you exercised your authority? By praying and getting real with God and saying, God I need you here right now. My mom often comes up with these little sayings that you never forget. And one day somebody was kind of 
teasing her and telling her in, the, in one of those facetious kind of ways. They said, well, I'm praying for you, Eloise. You know, a little condescending. And my mom just looked back at her and said, well, that's good. Because I need the prayer and you need the practice. <laughs> when you turn 70-something, you can say whatever you want to say. I, I think that's, that's the rule, right? So why do we pray? Does it really work? I want to give you five reasons why we pray. Number one, we pray to receive intimacy and relationship with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, with our Father in heaven. A young, a young lady asked me a little over a year ago out in the lobby here. She said, she said, Pastor Kevin, how do I get to know God better? And I asked her, how do you get to know your friend better? You spend time with her. You hang out together. You talk more. If you want to get to know each other more, you carve out more time to spend more quality time together. You go through some things together. It is no different with God. If you want to get to know God more, you've got to spend more time with him. And that is prayer. That happens in the context of prayer. Prayer is not some religious vibrato. Holy King James, thou art the mightiest Godeth in the universe. Lordeth. That's, that's not. That doesn't equate to more powerful prayer. Prayer is about real. It's about being real with God. It's about expressing your heart to God and then taking time to just listen for him to speak back to you. Picking up his word and prayerfully reading it. Not just out of some duty, but saying, God, I need to know you more. Please speak to me and help me to know you more. Speak to me from your word today as I, as I read it. And then put a journal right by your Bible so that you can start writing down the things that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. The more that happens, the more intimate you're going to become with him. The more in the more deep your relationship is going to be with him. I hear married couples, they come to me and they'll they'll start making all their disclaimers while they're separating and they'll say, "Oh, we just fell out of love." No, what happened is that you stopped spending quality time together. You stopped investing in the relationship. If you want your marriage to get better, you have to prioritize that relationship. You have to spend time. You got to take moments to look one another in the eye and you've got to get into one another's heart and mind and, and, and increase that intimacy. It's, it's, it's the same with God. If we want more of God, we have to dedicate time with him. And the more time you spend with Jesus, the more you're going to know him, the more you know him, the more you're going to see his heart and the more you're going to fall in love with him, with his heart and with his plan for your life. So number one, the reason why we pray is to increase our intimacy and our relationship with Jesus Christ. Number two, the reason why we pray is to get protection from our spiritual enemy. Now, this is where you can really say to the Holy Spirit, cover me, because you feel the fire of darkness coming against you. You feel the hellish attacks of demonic spirits coming against you. There are days that you wake up and you realize, wow, this is, this is hotter than normal. I mean, there's, there's something that, that's happening. I don't know what I did, but I woke up with, with my name on the chalkboard somewhere in hell today because there are all kinds of hell that's coming against me today. And it's on those days that you need to know how to say to the Holy Spirit, cover me, cover me. The more, the, close you, the closer you get to Jesus, the more you begin to move into your destiny and God's plan for your life, the more fire you are going to get from the enemy. And you may say, well, you're not really encouraging me to get closer to God today, preacher. 
Listen, I'm just being real with you. You know that if there are people around you that are jealous, they don't like it when you succeed. When you start succeeding, they're going to start attacking you. Why? Because you're walking in God and they're jealous. They're walking in a spirit of jealousy. And so that, that demonic spirit of jealousy manipulates and twists their arm and, and makes them uncomfortable. And they're going to come out against you. Well, Satan doesn't like it when you start getting closer to your destiny. Because God has ripped you out of Satan's trophy case. And now you're turning around and you're helping Jesus get more people out of the devil's trophy case that makes you a threat so that means he's going to come against you but thank God we have a promise from God's word that says greater is he Jesus that is in you than he Satan that's in the world if you never meet the devil face to face chances are you're going the same direction he is So count it a great privilege when you encounter resistance. That means you're on the right path. You're going in the right direction. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10. Paul told us something that was so powerful. I want to break this down for us for just a moment. He said a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. We read this last week. But against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Against mighty powers in this dark world. And against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, since you are in a spiritual battle he says and you've got a spiritual enemy coming against you therefore put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil and then he says then after the battle you will still be standing firm Stand your ground. And here's where he starts naming some of the specific pieces of armor that he wants us to put on. He says, number one, stand your ground putting on the belt of truth. Now, the belt of truth is the belt of being true. It's no coincidence that it covers your waist or your sexual or reproductive organs. Because if you're married, you want God's ability to stay true to your spouse. If you are single, you want the ability from God to stay true to your sexuality, to your sexual purity. You don't want to involve yourself in fornication, which is sexual relationships before you're walking down the aisle together. Before you say, I do. Before you enter into holy matrimony this is the piece of armor that helps you to stay true the belt of truth God's ability to give you to stay pure in your holy relationships when you might not have the ability to do so in your own strength God is here to help you then secondly he said to take on the body armor of God's righteousness what does that cover it covers our midsection our heart the breastplate of righteousness covers the heart I want God's righteousness to beat in my heart I want my heart to beat with God's heart I want our heartbeats to be one what grieves God's heart I want it to grieve my heart what makes God's heart happy and excited I want it to make my heart happy and excited I want my heart to be one with the righteousness of God and I'm praying that over my life then he said for shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared prepared to do what the gospel of peace covers your feet why because everywhere I go should be God going should me should me should be me going with God going with God walking with God everywhere I go on the job at school I'm prepared to say Jesus to somebody I'm prepared to give hope to somebody that doesn't have hope it's on my feet and every place I go I am ready to say that Jesus loves you and there is hope for your tomorrow 
So I put on the shoes of the gospel of peace. And then he says, in addition to these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Your faith is a defensive shield that when the devil tries to fire something into your heart to discourage you or to deceive you, you can lift up faith and say, not today, devil, not today. He says, you're a, you're a nobody, you're a nothing. You're saying, you're a liar, you're a liar. I know God loves me. I know Jesus loves me. He died for me he gave his all for me and I'm holding up my faith as a shield God you're you're you this is all gonna uh, fall apart no it's not devil because God promised me that he's gonna be here he's gonna do what he said he's gonna do he's the author and the finisher of my faith what he started in me he's gonna finish and then he said not only hold up your shield of faith but he said put on salvation as your helmet now, salvation happens in the heart. Why does he tell me to put salvation on my head? Because he wants my head to get the message of the, real, uh, of the reality that's already happened in my heart. In other words, he's ready for me to start thinking saved. I got saved in my heart. Now, how about let us letting our thinking catch up to the, to the salvation in our heart? He wants me to put salvation on my thinking processes every day, protect my thoughts. And then lastly, he said, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Every piece of armor I named already is a defensive piece of armor. The sword of the Spirit is your offensive weapon. Anybody knows defense Coach, Coach Gary, people say defense wins championships, but defense alone cannot win a championship. At some point, you got to score some points. You can't just be defensive. You got to have some offense. At some point, you got to score. You got to let the enemy know that he cannot keep doing this to you and not pay the price. You got to make the devil bleed a little bit and let him think twice about coming back to you the next time he wants to launch an attack. Watch out for that one because she, she'll, she'll stick you with that sword. And the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. When, God. when the enemy tries to speak something to you, you speak the truth of God's Word in the face of the facts that he's trying to put to you or the lies. And then lastly, he said, pray in the Spirit at all times, on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Why is this important? It is important because God has a high calling for your life. God's got something big for you to do. There are people that he needs you to touch. and You have to be prepared. You'll hear us a lot of time around the church. You, when I'm praying, when Bishop's praying, you'll hear us say, Father, I plead the blood of Jesus over this church. We use that word plead, and a lot of people don't understand it because they're not making the contact with, it, with the context of something that they hear all the time in our country. When we say I plead, it doesn't mean we're begging. It's the same as if when we're saying I plead the fifth. What is that? The fifth. It's the fifth amendment. It's the right to remain silent. I plead the fifth. I'm not begging. I'm just reaching out and taking an advantage of a God-given right that I have in this country based on a written rule, a law, an amendment. And so when I say I plead the blood, I'm not begging God for anything. I know that the blood of Jesus Christ covers our sins and protects us from Satan's attacks. So when I say, Father, I plead the blood over my kids right now, I'm not begging God. I'm simply taking advantage of something that he already wrote down, a rule he established, and it makes his heart glad and excited. He's going, "Woo! that girl down there knows my word, and she has taken advantage of something I given her and she is pleading the blood of my son over that situation prayer makes a difference the next reason we pray is to have the power to overcome obstacles and achieve our destiny last week I had a dream God woke me up it was at, it was um, 2 20 in the morning so Oren's talking about getting woke up by kids why well, I got woke up by a, a dream from the Holy Spirit at 2.20, and I woke up in a hot sweat. I got up, and in the dream, I saw myself running through a dark meadow, 
with high clumps of grass amongst the, the short grass, and the sky was dark and ominous. But I was running, and I mean, unlike some dreams I've had where I'm running from the enemy and I can't get my body to move. You ever had those dreams? This one was different. I had wings. I mean, I was flying, and I turned around, and I looked, and there was a whole group of 20-something and 30-something-year-old uh, young adults that were following me. And uh, I, I, there was one young man right here, an African-American young man, and he was running right with me, right off my left flank. And, uh, and we got to a ravine, and it was a deep canyon. And I leapt over that ravine, and I didn't just leap over it. I finessed it. I mean, my feet went up over my head like a sail. And I landed on the other side so smooth that I barely even felt my feet touch. And I looked back to check on the young man. And he got there and he jumped. But I could tell that his, his jump had more labor in it. It's the only time that I think a white man ever outjumped a black man <laughs> was in my dream. If I want that to happen, I got a dream about it. So I, I, I left, but he struggled with his leap. Because of his age, and, and, and which is actually opposite of what you would normally think, but I'll explain it in a second. And he barely made it to the other side, and when he did, he grunted when he landed because it hurt his knees. And then he got up, and he kept running with me, and we were running together. And we came to another ravine, and this canyon was wider than the last one. And on this one, I leapt, no hesitation, and I went higher than I've ever leapt before. And when I turned around to check him, he leaped, but he only went about six feet and then he disappeared into the canyon. When I got to the edge of the canyon, I heard him scream. And I knew that as he landed, his legs were shattered. And I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, the generation coming up behind you does not have the wings of the Holy Spirit yet. And I heard God say, you need to talk about prayer. You need to teach this generation that's coming up behind your generation that there is a power from the Holy Spirit that they are going to need as they encounter the obstacles that are coming up for them in this season of the United States of America in our world. And if they don't know the wings of the Holy Spirit that lifts them up over the obstacles as they are pursuing their destiny, they will crash and burn at the bottom of the canyon and they will become casualties. You're looking at a preacher that has a burden on my heart to tell you we have got to find the power of God in this season of time. We've got to find the power of God in these last days. Luke 10 and 19 says, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you, but only if you are walking in the authority of God that you receive through prayer. I have to bring this to a close. The next reason we pray is to receive knowledge and insight and instruction. The Bible says that eye has not seen, ear has not heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And a lot of people start, stop right there and say, well, that's it. They're just things we can't know. Not true. You don't stop reading. Look at the next verse. The next verse says, but God has revealed them to us. The world doesn't know it, but we know it. He has revealed them to us through his spirit, through prayer. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. There is a dimension of prayer that God wants you to get to, a dimension of the Spirit. There are days that I am facing problems. I don't know what I'm going to do with them. And I have to go, I have to break from what I'm doing and go find a place to start praying. And as I walk the floor praying in the Spirit, sometimes in English, sometimes in a heavenly language that God has given me, that God wants to give every person in this room today. If it's in the Bible, it's yours. People get freaked out by it. But if it's in the Bible, it's yours. And don't let religion tell you that it's not. Because there's something that happens as you begin to pray in the Spirit. Praying in that heavenly language, it's your spirit connects to God's spirit and it bypasses your limited education. And your spirit begins to commune with God and he can begin to download information to you. Download heavenly answers into your heart to give you answers for what's going on in your life. Think of it as an old friend or a mentor saying, I got some things to say to you that will make a major difference in your day if you'll just come and sit with me for a bit. But you can't have it if you don't go sit. 
And the last reason why we pray that I'm going to give you today, I'm sure there are more, but it's to intercede for intercession. Now, intercession is when you are really praying on behalf of somebody else. It's what some of y'all were doing in the Astros, for the Astros in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And you've done it for the Texans. And you've done it for the Rockets. I don't know when we're going to see it. It ain't working. I thought it worked two years ago. And I was going, whoa, thank you, Jesus. And then I found out that they cheated some games to get there, so I... Bottom line is I don't think God listens to our prayers for our sports team. It doesn't really work to intercede for our sports team. You can intercede for players on the sports team that God will bless them and make their lives better. But he's not going to sway the outcome because you've got other Christians that are praying for the other team as well. You could pray for the candidate of your choice, but you've got Christians on the other side that are praying for other candidates. I remember when I was in elementary school, I remember Nixon, I remember Ford, uh, uh, I remember Carter, but I wasn't old enough to vote till Reagan. And when I got in college, the, 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 the Reagan got into the presidency. And, and I started thinking about everybody since then. There was, there was Reagan, then there was uh, 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 George H., and then there was Clinton, and then there was George W., then Obama, and now Trump. I, I started looking at the pattern. The pattern since those days, since my elementary school days, was conservative, conservative, liberal, conservative, conservative, liberal, conservative, liberal, conservative. And I, I got to thinking, wow, sometimes my prayer got answered and sometimes it didn't. The only way I could say it got answered 100% of the time is if I prayed, God, have your way. <laughs> then regardless of what happened, I could say, "Woo, Lord, answer my prayer. Whether I agree with the outcome or not. So I'm talking to you about intercession, but watch what you're interceding for. Let's intercede for our country. Let's intercede for whoever God wants to put in that office. You never know who God wants to put in there. I heard a Ugandan pastor when I was in Africa say that God even put Idi Amin in office in Uganda, even though he killed over 100,000 of his own people. He was a brutal dictator. But that pastor said, I believe God raised him up. To get Uganda back to its knees in prayer. The Bible clearly says that God raises up kings and pulls them down. And that includes presidents. So we vote and we do our part. But in, in the end, we trust God for the outcome. Amen? But intercession is that moment when God puts a heaviness on your heart for one of your children, for a friend of yours, for somebody that you don't even know, for, for the president, for the governor, for a, a movie star. You might have this preoccupation with somebody in Hollywood's face in your heart one day, and you just got to break away and pray till that heaviness goes away. God, I don't know what that person's going through right now, but bless them, touch them, set them free from the chains that's holding them in bondage. And then pray and see if God releases you, if you know them, to text them and say, I've been praying for you today. I don't know what you're going through, but God is doing something in your life. That's intercession. Intercession. And your children's future depends on intercession. Romans 8 and 34 tells us that Jesus Christ is right now at the right hand of God the Father making intercession for us. We need to follow his example. And you may say, well, why does God need me to do that? Isn't he God? Can't he just do that on his own? Well, I already told you that he gave us charge of the earth. Check it out. It's in Genesis. He gave us charge. We forfeited that right to Satan. But then Jesus came to the earth and got it back from Satan. And now you and I have authority in the earth again. We pray Jesus is listening and it sets him free to begin to work miraculously on our behalf. And when you begin to pray, it gets you in on the partnership with Jesus that the Father wants to have happen. That's why the Bible says that you are heirs of God and you are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. He is our elder brother as well as being our savior. When you pray, it brings you into your purpose. 
And it gives you a compassion that displaces criticism. It makes you more like Jesus and less like a judge. Do you know that it's hard to keep hating somebody for whom you're interceding? If you have trouble with somebody, start praying for them. And it'll fix things in your heart. The Bible says God sent an angel to a man named Cornelius. He was an Italian man. And the angel told him, he said, hey, your prayers and your giving have come up before God as a memorial. I heard somebody say one time, if you pray enough about a situation, it'll make your memorial get so big in front of God that he's, he's got to answer it so he can see things again because it's blocking his view. I don't know exactly what that scripture means, but that sounds like a pretty good description. Your prayers go up as a memorial before God. And if you will keep praying, God is going to answer your prayer. He'll do it in his time, but he will answer it according to his will. Whatever you're facing today, whatever thing you're concerned about or worried about in our world, it's time for you to say yes to prayer. God needs you to make the difference. If you'll begin to pray 15 for 15, we're praying for the election and for the aftermath of whatever the result is, that God will bring peace back to our country and that he will bring, most importantly, revival to our world. Would you just close your eyes for a moment? If you're here and you don't even know Jesus yet, you haven't started this adventure of prayer. Prayer is a conversation between your heart and the heart of Christ. It's time to start today. And it starts right here, right now, with a prayer. That as you feel your heart being stirred and moved on, it's time for you to say, all right, God, here we go. If you're ready to believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and my sins, that he was buried in the grave, but he rose again on the third day. He rose from the grave, and he is alive today and wants to live in your heart. If you're ready to believe that, would you just pray this prayer with me right now? Let's pray. Church, help me out. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me so much. You gave your only son to die for my sins. Jesus, I believe you rose from the grave. You're alive. I open my heart to you. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Teach me to pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, can we give God some praise right now for these who have said yes to Jesus today? Woo! If you said yes to Jesus online, we're asking you to stay tuned for our hosts that are coming back to tell you what to do. We love you. We'll see you next week. Have a blessed week. In Jesus